Um, I have a great pleasure in introducing Tom Kirchhoff, uh, who will be explaining his adventures uh, on building uh, a multi-tenant pass on Microsoft uh, Azure. Tom is an Azure architect uh, at Codit and a Microsoft Azure uh, MVP. Uh, you can actually follow all his adventures on his blog, which is blog.tomkirchhoff.be. Tom, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. So all good things start with a disclaimer. So this is, uh, this is my lessons from the field. You will not see any silver bullets. Uh, I also have way too many slides, so I might skip some of them. Um, because I have 80 slides for 40 minutes, so it's not possible. Um, but they will all be available afterwards, so don't uh, worry. So let's start with scaling. Scaling is very important. Um, just a, a brief recap, there are two types, so you can scale up or down, where you basically get a bigger box. So when you reach the limits, you scale the box up, you have a small amount of downtime, but you can keep on moving on. Very simple. Um, then you have scale out. Scale out is the more frequently used one because you don't have any downtime because you just add more instances. But from an application perspective, that's harder because your application needs to be designed that way. Also, your traffic routing needs to work with that. So scaling is basically not easy because we already covered two uh, approaches. But what about the technology that we're using? So scaling is really important when you, have, when you are picking your compute infrastructure. And here's a small overview of, uh, of some approaches in Azure, where on the left side is basically functions as a service. We don't need to care about anything. We just run code functions. While on the other right, we have bare metal VMs, which we fully run ourselves. We deploy them ourselves. We maintain them ourselves. So the more control you need, the more complexity. And every service has its characteristics. How do we package our application? How do we deploy our application? How do we scale our application? So before deciding on which service you'll use, think about those things. For example, scaling. Let's say we're using Azure Functions. We're taking messages from a queue. So Azure Functions will automatically spin up more instances for us in order to drain the queue. Super simple. Now the good part is they handle all the scaling for us. The bad part is they handle all the scaling for us. We do not have control. The only thing you can do is read the documentation, learn how it works, and take it into account. For a lot of scenarios, that might be very good. For others, it might not. There's also not really a lot of awareness on how it scales. You'll only see it on your bill. There are a few metrics uh, available, which I'll show, but it's very hard to know how many instances am I running and is my app actually doing what I want it to do. Which goes to the third part, it's very dangerous to burn your money. Like this guy. He had a small um, Boolean turned on, run on startup where he figured if I turn on the function app, it will run this piece of code. Actually, it run every time it started a new host instance for Azure Functions. So that resulted in queuing a lot of messages, triggering other functions, running a lot more of compute, which basically exploded his bill. If he would have had the awareness, he could have prevented it. So serverless is good, it's not perfect. So Let's go to pass. Why not? So in this case, we have cloud services where we have an orders role. Again, it's draining a queue. But they don't scale it for us. We need to use an autoscaler to tell, OK, if my queue has more than one message, add a new instance to automatically scale my role. So the good thing is I can define how it scales. I have control if I really care. Some scenarios you don't, some you do. That's also the bad part, you have to define those rules. Because what's a good metric to autoscale on? Is it 10 messages, 100, 200, 300? We don't know. It's a lesson you need to learn by doing. You need to tweak those rules while you go. As your platform scales, 
uh, sorry, as your platform grows, those rules might change. So nothing is written in stone. Now the bad part is you need to be aware of flapping. Flapping is well documented on that link, but basically it says that um, if I define on 200 messages, I need to scale up. If I have 150 messages, I need to scale down. There will always be this area where the autoscaler will think, okay, I need to scale down. By the time it's scaled down, it need to scale up again and down and up, and this is the flapping concept. It's very hard to find a good, um, good scaling rules. And it also, infinite scaling rules are fun. I'll come back to that later. Um, but basically, again, it burns your money. And Azure Autoscale is a good example of one of those autoscalers which you can use in Azure. Um, more on that later. But again, I want more control. Let's give, give me a cluster platform as a service. In this case, it's Kubernetes where I have two nodes, where I have two different pods draining a queue. So how the hell do I scale those? There's a lot of infrastructure you need. So for example, in this case, I need a horizontal pod autoscaler with a custom metric adapter to pull the metrics from Azure Monitor. You run them yourself. You need to operate them. So once I turn them on, my pods start auto scan. Then, whoops, I need more instances. But now my cluster, his resources are out. What do I do now? Yet another component, a cluster autoscaler. And then you have more nodes, more pods. Everybody's happy. Until your cluster is full, you've reached the service limitations. Don't worry, use virtual kubelet. Then you can overflow to Azure Container Instances. Run it over there. So I think you get the idea. I can share the resources for my cluster with different teams, but scaling is very hard. I need to run my own infrastructure. The components are everywhere. Um, I need to know how to scale these things. So it's hard to keep track of everything. And it gives me a lot of responsibility to make sure that everything is in place. Okay. So the bottom line is, none of these are bad. None of them are the silver bullet. Use the tool that you need. Evaluate your options. Check what scaling needs you have, what the trade-offs are of the service, and learn how to use them. Don't over-engineer as well. Maybe you can start with Azure Functions today, and in one year when your customer base has uh, increased with 1,000%, it's time to move on to something with, which has better scalability where you have that control that you need. But not today. Always start as passy as possible and then go down the stack of responsibility. And awareness is one of the most important things with autoscale. So we've seen the Azure function scenario. Um, we've mentioned infinite autoscaling rules. So you need to be aware of what's going on this will help you avoid burning all your precious money. Because in the end, we're all businesses. We want to make money and not only burn money. So um, <clears throat> it's also important to run your auto-scaling not only in production, but through all your environments so that you can learn along the way and not only have the issues in production when it's too late. And these are these awareness. Um, basically helps you create insights on how many nodes do I have. It allows you to detect these infinite scaling loops. So one example is um, at the customer, we were auto-scaling on service bus message, message count. So back, back in the day, message count was all the messages. Active messages, that letter messages. So we had a bug which caused messages to that letter. Then auto-scaling says, Ah, you have 2,000 messages. I need to keep on adding instances. But the dead letter messages were not handled. So basically, in 30 minutes, we went from one instance to 20 instances because 20 was the maximum. Imagine not having a maps maximum. Then that would have been fun. Luckily, we had this awareness where um, basically Azure Monitor was calling a webhook, which was triggering a logic app. The Logic app was posting a message in Slack saying, we scaled from one instance to two instances. So the team became aware, something's wrong, disable the autoscaler, investigate, 
And that's how we um, basically save money. So with Azure Functions, there's a metric which is called function execution count. So what it does is it shows the execution count for a specific function, and you can also split it by instance. So it gives us somewhat of insights on how your app is scaling in terms of how many executions it has, but there's no way to know how many instances you are running as a metric. Meaning, if there's no metric, you cannot alert on it, which is also very important. Now, with this graph, you can somewhat see that we have the, the typical processing flow. If we would deploy the, the change with the run on startup, you would see that it would spike and you can still investigate. So it's certainly possible to operate it into a certain sense, but it's not fully ideal. Now, a few tips um, with respect to scaling. If you're auto-scaling, resource consolidation pattern is not really ideal. Where the pattern says, if you have two processes and I run on cloud services, let's say, I run them in one role because that's my billing unit. But that means that you're auto-scaling the order service and the shipping service with the same cadence. That's not really the good approach. So you need to choose one or the other. Always set the maximum instance count. Um, again, this is something you'll need to learn over time, but always set once. Um, Azure Monitor is a hidden gem. You should really have a look at that one. It gives you everything a good autoscaler should do. And also use budget alerts, uh, again, to be aware in case of, for example, Azure Functions is using uh, way more than it typically uses. If you use your own metrics to autoscale on, make sure that it's representable. Meaning, let's say that uh, if you have a metric which says, okay, we've created X amount of orders, make sure that you can, for example, split it by tenant if you have a multi-tenant system. Make sure that it's, um, if you partition it, that uh, you also have insights on that so that you can scale an individual partition. Um, again, those are all things you need to learn over time, but keep those in mind. Multi-tenancy is all about choices. Um, these are some of the questions you need to ask, but they will all impact how you build your system. For example, do the customers need access to the data? If so, then how will you prevent that they see other customers' their data? Um, does your pricing need to be reflected, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But multi-tenancy is more than data sharing. Why? Because depending on your multi-tenancy, you also need to um, choose the correct deployment model. For example, if you need full isolation, you need to really fully deploy separate resources per tenant. It's more expensive, but it gives you the isolation. While if there's no need for this, you can just deploy multiple stamps across multiple geographies and spread the databases across multiple instances to have the full scale. Or you can have one app with a split data store, with shards, it's also possible. But again, it depends on your scenario. You need to think up about this up front. You can change it later on, but it will be harder. So sharding, um, I won't go too much in detail, but basically instead of having the one database that you keep on scaling up, you have multiple smaller databases which you scale out, which is a lot easier from a database scaling perspective but again, your application needs to be aware of that and needs to know to which shard it should connect. So here's a small example on uh, how Key Vault can really help you, where let's say we have an order processor who gets a message for a specific tenant. Order processor says, hey, shard manager, how do I connect to customer cello? Shard manager connects to Key Vault, says, give me the secret for tenant cello and it gives the connection string back and it knows which shot owned, uh, is owned by Celo. A very simple example, but for a lot of scenarios where you need to have that tenant isolation, this works perfectly. Because the application does not need to be aware of the tenants, the secrets are securely stored in Key Vault and it delegates that to Key Vault as well. 
Now, in the example, you've seen the concept of a shard manager. So basically, a shard, a shard manager is just the bookkeeper of all the shards. So the application does not know where which tenant is. The shard manager knows. So he just asks him, where do I go? Depending on your scenario, um, there are different flavors for this. Um, but basically, you can use Key Vault, like we've just seen. There's also an official one called the Azure SQL Database Elastic Tools, um, which uses a SQL database to store all this information, and then an alarm bell goes off. Why? Because that means they store the connection strings, plain text, in a SQL database. From a security perspective, that's not really nice, so that's why I use Key Vault, for example. But if you have more complex scenarios, you can also build your own. Now, we have a lot more databases, which gives another problem, cost. So if we just create a lot of databases, we have a lot of unconsumed resources. So in this example, we pay 200 euros for 160 DTUs, while we only use 20%. Now, what can you do? You can add an elastic pool. So that's one of those other hidden gems in Azure, which is Azure SQL Elastic Pool, which basically creates a resource pool of uh, DTUs, so database transaction units, uh, sorry, EDTUs, Elastic Database Transaction Units. You can add multiple databases to the pool, they share the resources, and you only pay for the pool capacity, meaning you can reduce the total size. So before we had 160 DTUs, now we can, for example, use 100 and only pay for that. If we see that we have more tenants, we scale the whole pool. Now that means that if we have one noisy tenant, in this case number seven, he consumes uh, 93 DTUs of the whole pool. So if another one needs more resources, Basically, he, the pool is not able to give it to him because tenant seven is all already consuming everything. So over there, there's a nice concept of um, database limits where I can say every tenant can use up to 50, 70, whatever DTUs. If they want more than that, they will not get it, which uh, avoids that one tenant can bring down your whole pool. So in this case, he will get 50, say, I want more, you're not getting it, so that the other one can get more. Now in certain scenarios, um, specific customers just need more consumption because they're, they're more heavily using your application. So in that case, you can also um, split your pools into multiple pools so that you reduce the impact of that one customer and the other ones are fine. Now, if you have a pricing model, this is a nice opportunity to reflect this because I can create a basic, standard, and premium pool where if that specific customer wants more consumption, he needs to pay for it, so he gets in the premium pool. If he's just trying to um, use a trial of your application, they get in the basic pool and they basically need to use whatever they get for free. So in this case, different pools have different DTUs assigned and the limitation per tenant is also higher than the others. Now again, is there a best practice? No, it all depends on your application. So you can mix and match these concepts, um, but it's always better to move them into a pool instead of having a lot of uh, smaller databases. Um, also, from a billing perspective, you just see that you get a build for the pool and not every individual database. But always set that maximum consumption. Even if it's going to impact that one customer, it's better to impact one customer than all the others. Use the multiple pools to split them. Um, and also monitor your pools. Because in the past, you had to monitor in the, every individual database. You still have to do it. But from a consumption perspective, you also need to uh, operate the pool. Because you want to be aware that 
we're reaching 90% of our total uh, resources. So maybe we need to split into multiple pools. Maybe we need to um, scale the pool up or whatever, but just react to it. Now, multi-tenancy also means that our API needs to know which tenant is calling me. So in the queue example, we knew it because it was part of the, the, the message payload. But let's say we have an API, then we don't know. If you're using an API gateway, this is a nice opportunity. So things like API management allow you to um, have the concept of users and groups. So what we did was we created a group per customer where we had obviously a prefix because a gateway is for multiple applications. But when I was calling the gateway, I had a specific API key. And that API key gave the gateway the capability to map it back to my user. It saw that it was that I'm part of, um, in this case, the group Cello. And it was able to determine the tenant. It added a custom header, sent it back to the backend, and they were able to resolve my um, chart. Now, this is one way of doing it, but there are others. But we've seen that this is a very easy way um, of adding that concept. And it was just a simple API management policy. Simple as that. So we've seen scaling. We've seen um, multi-tenancy. But we also need to monitor. And monitor is also a tricky one. Um, and we've all seen this nice wall where we throw our beloved application over to operations. And then we deploy it. Operations thinks everything is fine. The devs see that shit is hitting the fan. But the ops don't know it. So we all Joe, laugh because we've seen it happen. Is it the fault of operations? No. Is it the fault of the devs? No. It's a shared responsibility. Back in the day, we had longer projects. We could do full handovers where it was easy. But now we've gone into more of an agile way where the developer should already care about monitoring. Even if they don't care, they should. One way to do that is to force them. So I always train them to use their own operating tool set by running live infrastructure tests, meaning we run black box tests, integration tax, uh, tests, whatever, against um, Azure resources where they cannot attach their debugger to. If there's an incident, they need to rely on their own operation tooling. Um, where one of the um, cornerstones from a developer perspective is enriching your telemetry. This is really important. You need to have that context on what is going on. And you need to have enough context to know what's going on. But not too much. You see what the issue is? The more telemetry you send, the more you pay. But you should have enough. Um, correlation is one of the most important things over there. Um, I'll show it in the next slide. But you need to see all the telemetry, metrics, requests, events, etc for one operation. You need to see who made that operation, but you should not track GDPR-related information. You should obfuscate it. Um, always include application information as well. For example, what's the service, um, what's the instance, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can also correlate these things across issues. Maybe one instance is just having an issue. Maybe it's just your service. If, it's, if they are creating an order, which order is it? How will you investigate, et cetera, et cetera. Those might all seem uh, sound convenient, but it's not convenient for everybody. <clears throat> so let's say we're, again, using a front end to get the products. Turns it from the database. We create an order. Order gets used. Order gets um, persisted in the database. So there are already two things here. We have two operations. One is to get all the products. Two is to create a, an order. Now, in general, we have one session for that user, which can also be interesting. So we create a session ID. And then there's the third part, where we have the message on the queue. And then the order processor tries to process the message. It fails, because maybe our database is being throttled. 
queue goes back, a message goes back to the queue, reprocess it, then it succeeds, and then you need a cycle ID. So this is something that does come up a lot, but we've seen that if you have um, message processing and it retries multiple times, you need to individually see the processing of one message cycle. Meaning, if I want to investigate the first failure, and I only have the operation ID, you'll get a lot of noise, which you don't need. If you have a cycle ID, which you assign to every message processing attempt, then you only see the telemetry for that attempt, which is a lot better. Now, do you need all of these layers? No, but I would recommend it. The health checks is also very important. Um, because you need to know if not only if your application is already live, but is it also uh, able to serve traffic already? If you have an auto-scaling auto system with um, uh, things like traffic manager in front, traffic manager needs to know, can I already send traffic to that instance? If you don't have health checks, that's not possible. Now, things like um, deployments, Measuring latency with things like application insights, um, availability monitoring can also benefit from it. So just adding one thing can bring a lot of value. Now you also have noisy systems like the availability checking. It pings every X minutes. Maybe somebody configures this on your health endpoint, but you don't like it. So what I always recommend is always apply throttling on those endpoints. Because maybe they will, while your app was still alive, it will bring your app down because it kept on hammering it. Um, and also the connection management is important because you can go as far as you want. You can just return an OK if it can load or you can also check every dependency. But if you every time create a connection to your database and you do not correctly handle it, you will basically drain your whole connection pool to the database, creating an outage. That's not nice. Now what I always do in the basic, oh sorry, health checks do not bring added value to the business until it's too late. Because building an application is great, but having an application that's not available is useless. And this is a quick win, because a health check can just be this, just an API operation returning okay. Because if it returns okay, that means your API has already started up, it's successfully started up, and it can serve traffic. You can extend this with dependency information, but it depends on, on your application. But I always include this as a default. Now, alerts are super important. This is something where Logic Apps also shines, is um, Azure Monitor allows you to define alerts and trigger a webhook. I always use a logic app for that because it's super simple. You receive the request, do something with it. It can be posting to Teams or Slack to create awareness. It can be emailing people, sending texts with Twilio or whatever. They, ha they all have this out of the box. Now what I do recommend is, and for all the BizTalk people this will seem convenient, um, but use adapters. Because um, in the past, we always triggered our centralized alert handler directly. And then Azure Monitor team decided to change the contract every week as a figure of speech. So they st started sending us different payloads. We were not able to process them. So we spun up a new instance with a new contract. We ran them in parallel. So it was a mess. So basically what I recommend is create an adapter per contract type map it to your internal format, and then trigger the centralized alert handler. Then you do the effective logic. And if you're still using Azure Classic Alerts, it's time to move it because it's deprecated. They just extended it to August 2019. So if you're still using them, you need to move now. Um, as of today, they also have the Azure Monitor metric alert, which is specific for metrics. They now also have the Azure Monitor Common Schema, which is a schema for all their type of notifications. Um, so now you need to choose. I'm still not convinced which one is the best. 
I'm still using the left one. Anyhow, um, there's a new template in Logic Apps which gives you the, um, the requests trigger with the contract of the default metric schema. So if you want to get started easily, you can use this, uh, this template. Um, and then another one which typically only the big companies do, is writing RCAs, um, publishing them publicly uh, for their customers. Now I'm a big fan of doing this even for smaller companies, even in development, because it will train your developers and operation people to already write RCAs before they actually have a big outage. They learn how to explain what the issue is. Um, they learn how to document it, think what the action points are and follow up on them, etc., etc. If you only do this in production, they will drop the ball on this. Now, another benefit of this is that if I'm analyzing an outage and my colleague reads this RCA, he not only knows about the issue, but he also knows how I troubleshooted it. So maybe I'm using a different approach than he, he does, but he can learn from me or I can learn from him based on my RCA. So it's also some kind of knowledge transfer between um, team members. And the most important thing of these things is there's no such thing as failure. You should only um, learn from what went wrong and how can you prevent it in the future. This is super important. Use a no-blame culture. <sighs> oh, time. Ten minutes. Uh-oh. Um, webhooks. So I'll go really quickly on this section, but webhooks is a good example. We're handling alerts, so that means we call a logic app. Logic app uses generated URLs. Those are very evil. What if that instance gets deleted by accident, we spin up a new one, the third party says, where did he go? We spin up the new instance, we're good to go, right? Nope, we have a different URL. Your application is broken. So this is where an API gateway is very important. Another reason why is um, maybe we have a fully secure API which uses mutual authentication Third party tries to authenticate for the webhook, boop, no certificate. Third parties do not support this. They either use a, an, uh, a query parameter with an API key, um, or if you're lucky, a custom header, but that's it. You have to deal with this. So this is where an API gateway comes in. Um, the gateway allows you to reduce the security to the gateway and make it secure internally. Also, it decouples your internal architecture from the third party. If I integrate with PayPal and I decide to change my API and split it in an order API and a stock API, PayPal doesn't care. They just have that one URL. You don't want to update that URL. You just do it internally. Um, and in the past, we always... Um, explicitly opened the endpoint for webhooks, but apparently API management has support for passing the subscription key as a query parameter as well, so you can use that for a more secure approach. If you're publishing webhooks yourself, it's very important to do it in a user-friendly approach. If you allow customers to register in your system themselves, give them the capability to pass application information. Um, where we found this useful was that we were integrating with the data provider for flight information and we wanted to subscribe for the flight Brussels London. Now we did that because we did it for a specific order in our system. Now the issue that we've had was when they come back to us and say hey the flight that you subscribe to is cancelled, we had no clue which order it was for. Luckily, they gave us, gave us the capability to provide metadata. So when we subscribed, we say, hey, notify us about this flight. Um, and by the way, this is for order ID XYZ in our system. So when it came back, they included XYZ. We know which order it was. We know how to process it. Also, instead of only um, allowing them 
to create um, new subscriptions also allow them to update and delete. Because in our system we had an issue where we created thousands of subscriptions for webhooks which we didn't need. Luckily they had an API to list all the subscriptions so that we could delete them. But you don't want to email that, um, that third party say, hey, we messed up. By the way, can you delete all of these subscriptions? No, that's way too slow. You should provide an API that does that for you. And you should also, um, as a webhook publisher, include your correlation ID so that the consumers can use that or send it to support if they're having issues or whatever. Another reason why is you should provide an invocation history. If I um, send a webhook to my customer, the customer needs to see what the call looked like because maybe they had an issue they want to investigate. If you do not have this, this is a problem. You're forcing them to provide telemetry on their end and maybe you're just calling the wrong endpoint. So this is where I'll have to skip some slides. Um, one thing I want to mention is if you're publishing webhooks, don't think as a publisher. Think as a consumer. How do you want to use the service? How do you want to receive, receive the events? Now I'll skip the an interesting part. Maybe I'll have time. This is the key takeaway of the whole presentation. Embrace change. So in the past, we were used to using these releases. We still do. Um, this is perfectly normal. But um, the issue was it's hard to shift the product focus. But on the positive side is we had very stable releases. Ones that, well, stable, more stable than we sometimes now have. Let's call it like that. Um, but we were sure that it was working and that we could migrate to this because that's what we get. It will be this for the next couple of years. But from a product perspective, it sometimes felt like this. So we wanted to go really fast, but we couldn't because we were only releasing every few years. Now, of course, Agile came, we changed everything. We need to ship every three weeks. We need to be changing our product backlog every day, et cetera, et cetera. And then it got better. We had DevOps, we had to deploy to production every couple of days. And then we just started working on it without thinking and DevOps turned in DevOps, oops. Our production system is down. Is DevOps wrong? No, but you are not Netflix. You cannot do this in one day. It's, uh, it requires a full mental change, not only in the mindset, but also the company culture. If you want to do this, you need to do it step by step. So some things we did was get rid of the manual interventions. Those are evil if you need to deploy and need to change settings here and there. That's wrong, you should automate this. Of course, some things cannot um, be automated. That's fair. Then you need to keep a list of everything that needs to be done, but try to get rid of them. Another aspect is automatically deploy your application. So not only automate the configuration, create full automated release pipelines, preferably through every single environment to every single customer. This sounds magical. It requires investment. But once you have it, it's really nice. If you, why is this important? Not just to ship, but to ship hot fixes. If there's an issue, you will certainly forget things if you deploy it manually. While if you have a process that does it all for you, you will not have, well, you will less probably have it. Let's call it like that. And then one of the other um, things you can do is use build or infrastructure as code where you declaratively describe how your application works. Do you have to do this? No, I recommend it, but it will make it easier for your team to have consistent deployments. Okay, you might have noticed <clears throat> that um, things change a lot and that's how our industry works nowadays, right? 
we were used to shipping every year, multiple years, it's fine. Nowadays, companies ship all the time. So that means that the application that we are building depends on the infrastructure that is constantly changing. Maybe an issue that was there to, uh, yesterday is gone today. Maybe something that worked yesterday doesn't work anymore. The service providers are also humans. They also make mistakes. They don't have a full um, army of rock star developers. No, they are just human beings like you and me. Another thing that we see is cloud, cloud vendors are competing with each other. So what do they do? They have a good idea, they throw it out, they see if it sticks, and if it doesn't stick, they kill it. If you're lucky, they kill it. Maybe just kill the investment, which is worse for you. Staying up to date has been a problem. Um, and I don't know who knows any of these services. Is Dan here? No, damn it. Service bus for Windows Server. I've used it. The problem is that all of these are either gone, um, deprecated, or no longer in invested. So we as a customer use them. But because the lack of investment, other services that are better, other reasons, they are not really around anymore. For example, BizTalk Services is gone. We have Logic Apps, which is the successor of it, for example. Every service goes through a life cycle, which starts in private preview, which is the MVP, basically, which is being tested behind closed doors. If the customers want it, it goes public in public preview. But maybe it doesn't even go public. If it's in public preview, it's still very rough, but everybody can give it a spin, right? However, you still need to be careful because there is only an SLA when something is G8. So that means if you want to go to production in six months, using a, a public preview feature is unlikely to be a good idea because it, if, it's not in, in, uh, if it's not GA already, your production depends on something that, is not, that does not have an SLA, which is not a good idea. And all good things come to an end, and then it can end in three scenarios. Either it's fully deprecated, they're silently sunsetting it, they never talk about it anymore, or it's being reincarnated. The second one is the hardest one. So the official deprecation is, okay, we announce it deprecated, it's dead, you need to move it, you have until let's say, in one year to get off it. If you're lucky, you get some migration guidance. Again, if you're also lucky, there's an alternative. But this is not always the case. Reincarnations, however, are the somewhat best uh, scenarios where, um, and actually, let me get the examples. So, for example, Data Factory V1 is reincarnated in V2. So V1 was, wasn't really that good, but it was, it was um, closing a gap in the current offering. Now with V2, um, they improved it. So that's good for us, right? But we still had to migrate from V1 to V2, which requires planning, effort, uh, testing, investment, etc. Same with Azure Functions Host. Is that bad from those service perspective? No, because that means they are improving the system, but we are still impacted by this. Now the silent deprecation is a tricky one um, and the example is not really deprecated. It's just a gut feeling, but they do not invest in it anymore. There's no new news about it. It's still running fine. Does that mean you should not use it? No, you can still use Azure Cloud Services. Is it a smart move? Maybe, maybe not. And also it's not only your infrastructure, it's also your tooling. Like last year they deprecated Azure DevOps cloud-based testing. So it, it's also about your tool chain. 
now I need to really hurry up, um, but choosing an alternative is sometimes choosing between a stable dinosaur that you know what it is or the new shiny. So what do you choose? You choose a shiny one, right? Maybe. Not always. Again, it comes down to use the tool that fits your needs. Maybe an older product, which is not that shiny, is still the best option. Maybe it's time to use the new shiny technology. But be aware, because shiny technologies can either be um, not fully stable, has a learning curve, so you need to train your team, etc., etc. So you need to decide as a team as well. Because one of the debates I'm having lately is, yeah, Azure DevOps now has YAML, let's use YAML. I'm like, okay, you know YAML, I know YAML, but does the other guy know YAML? No. Okay, so we need to educate him. If somebody new on boards, then we need to educate him. Is it worth the effort? Again, maybe, maybe not. So those are all decisions you need to make. And sometimes it's better to build or uh, it's better to build it instead of buying or using something. But be careful with that. There is no silver bullet. So I need to skip. Um, but sometimes you only see the tip of the iceberg. Maybe you think it's a good idea, but it's not. Maybe you think it's a bad idea, but it's not. You learn by doing. And sometimes you regret your choices. Now, I'll stop with this slide, but building a platform in the cloud is never finished. That also means that a project mindset, in my opinion, is not a good one. You need to use a product mindset. We cannot define today how much effort it will take to build something by uh, two years, because maybe down the road they deprecate our core services and we need to migrate. That's very hard. You need to have that culture mindset, uh, that uh, product mindset. And make sure you prepare for your migrations. Plan your, uh, test your alternative, plan for the migration, etc. And nothing is written in stone. If you're wrong, that's okay. Just admit it, move on. Anyway, change is coming, so you better be prepared. Thank you very much. Covey.com.